I was brought up in a household of nurses, I say. My mum had been a nurse for many, many, many years. And I remember spending Christmas Eve in the day room of... Um, it was a ward at Withington Hospital um, with the elderly. And my younger brother and I would wait there until Daddy came and picked us up. So Mummy had to go to work. So Colin and I used to have to go to... Well, not have to, but that's what we did. And so I remember it being a Christmas Eve and we were helping feed the patients back then, you know, assist the patients to eat. And I suppose that's where it started. But my mum was a nurse. My Two of my mum's sisters were nurses. And I've got an auntie on my dad's side who was also a nurse. So I think... It's in my blood. There was not much I could do about it. It was what I was going to do. Well, before I went, started my training, um, I sort of did OK at school. Um, didn't do as well as I could have done, but I thought, well, I only need five O levels to get into nursing. Didn't really push myself, so I've got my five O levels. And what started applying to be a nurse. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I... I'd always going to be a general nurse. That was all what I was, I'd applied for, was going to be a general nurse. And my sister-in-law, she was also a nurse as well. And she'd just completed her RGN, or SRN as it was called then. And she'd said to me, oh, I'd got into Manchester Royal, and um, but it was a year's waiting, waiting list, or waiting time for me to get in. And she said, oh, why don't you apply to do your psyche? I'd never even heard of it and um, mental health nursing and thought, oh, that sounds good, I think I'll do that. And I wanted to leave home, so it was an opportunity to apply for a job away from home. So off I went down to um, Surrey, Banstead Hospital. And my mum's reaction was, an, you know, very sort of, my mum's traditional Jamaican, why do you want to go and work with those mad people? That was her re response initially. So off I went and um, that's just what I want to do, mum. But I was advised to do a couple of months as a nursing auxiliary before I committed to my training, just in case I didn't like it. So um, off I went and uh, did three months um, as a nursing auxiliary. Absolutely loved it. Came back um, buzzing, literally buzzing. Oh, this is what I want to do. And my mum looked at me and she went, hmm, that you didn't choose that job, that job chose you, chose you. And I knew I'd made the right choice. And I think my mum saw my personality and how it was suited for mental health nursing. So I went off and did my training. And I mentioned earlier that I um, it was something that I've always wanted to do. I was now nearly 19. I actually started my training the day before my 19th birthday. So I was still a baby um, <laughs> and I was away from home. But I wasn't too far away from family. My family... Um, I've got family that lived in, in London and my big my cousins, who became my big brothers now, by default, um, literally, they'd pick me up on a day off from nursing school and I stayed at my auntie's. I wasn't allowed to go out and gall gallivanting. I was there to study. So I was, I was very protected through my training, but in one sense. But then on the other sense, um, I was exposed to a lot of stuff, as you are as a student nurse, you know, um, literally... Oh God, I think of all the different things. Um, there was one particular school. Um, I'd come back from the interview and I was really excited at the opportunity. And I was telling my mum about it and she said, well, they wanted, you, they wanted me to come and do some char um, volunteer work. And she said, well, why do you want me to do volunteer work? I said, I don't know, they want me to come and do some volunteer work. And my mum said, you're not going. And I didn't think, I didn't know anything at the time. I just thought, mummy says, no, I can't go. I can't go. And it was only later that my mum was concerned why they wanted me to do it. And my mum said they were testing you. She felt as though they were testing me and based on my colour and would I, um, would I fit in into that environment and what I've and I said I said before my mum protected me because she didn't tell me it was about race until I think she thought I was old enough and she didn't put any um she didn't put any preconceived ideas in my head if that makes sense she didn't give me a bad 
oh, you're going to come across this or you're going to come across that. But if she saw it, she cut it, she sort of shut it down before I was affected. So I was protected in that sense. I think I had to find out for myself. But she didn't want to give me any concerns. I went to a place in Surrey and I remember travelling up with my friend from school. We travelled on the bus and the train and a coach to get to, to, to get to this place. And it's in the middle of Surrey, so there wasn't many black people. And it was like, OK, this is a tad strange. I've come from Longside in Manchester, so I'm used to a very multicultural <laughs> sort of area and um, community. And it was to come to this area that I thought, oh, dear. Not, oh, dear, but, oh, this is strange. And it was, oh, dear, it was like, oh, this feels different. And the area that the, the nursing school was was very different, but it was in a large, um, as they would call it, asylum, large psychiatric hospitals, but it was a multicultural um, you know, sort of community within this within the hospital. I was also fortunate that one of my tutors was black, which was it was her first. We were her first set of students. We found out later. We didn't know at the time. We found out later, and there were two other black girls in the class. So you automatic. So there was one other black girl in that in the class, and we became a, a little group. You know, there's me and another girl, sort of three or four of us all sort of gang people. Just I say gang, we became a little group of friends um, that studied together. And you, when we were together in the classroom, we were fine. But when you went out onto the wards, you were on your own. So you would often, despite it being a multicultural um, environment, when you got to the wards, you were on your own as a black... I felt I was on my own as a black student nurse with a northern accent um, that was having to, I say, sort of, you know, navigate nursing and navigate growing up and navigating the differences. So some nurses treated you well, some not so well. And there'd be the subtleties... Um, oh, you can go on last break. Oh, you've had, you just have 10 minutes. And it'd be those little things. But as a student nurse, you didn't argue. You just got on with it. It's only as you sort of get a bit older and you think, you know, second year, you think, hang on a second. Or you've gone to ward, first ward, first ward, second ward, third ward. You think, I've got a bit bolshy now. I can ask a question. <laughs> well, not bolshy, but a bit more confident, should I say. <laughs> um, but that was, and that was, and if I think about it, it was actually counter to who I am because I'm actually quite a confident person so I think the first year I kind of lost some of my confidence because of that those many different things I was having to encounter and I said before I was protected that was away from I mean I came away from the, the nursing school went home to, went to my aunties and got proper dinner and learned to do all those things and that was where my protection was so I suppose that was my balance but going back into the wards you know I had to behave myself you know, I was there for a purpose. And I used the word behave. You know, you do as you're told, don't argue. And that's, you, you know, my auntie told me that, my mum told me that, you know, you're there for a reason, you do what you've got to do. I had a a plan. And um, going back to, right back to when I was applying for nurses, nursing training, my mum said, you are not applying, you cannot apply for a two-year course. I had to do an SRN course or an RMN, well, as it turned out, an RMN. And that was because she didn't want me to not be able to progress. So that was one of the stipulations, and that was why I had to have the 5-0 levels, you know, so that I could go on and do... Um, I could have a career in nursing. Back in those days, you, were, you got a job very easily. Um, you didn't always have a choice about the job, and... And that's really, when I think back, um, there was acute nursing, there was med um, rehab, and there was elderly. And all the black nurses on the, ended up on the elderly wards, where it was the harder, more, and I use the word, labour-intensive 
So you had to do your first six months. We all had to do six months kind of, you know, post-training. And I remember most of my colleagues, and I'm, I'm thinking if there's anybody that went straight to an acute ward, I think we all went to, to elderly wards. Um, one of those little things that only in retrospect you think, oh, hang on. And it's, it's many years later. It wasn't sort of like two or three years later that I thought this was happening. I think we just accepted it. We'd got a job. We were happy to have a job. I was fortunate, again, maybe because I am a little bit forward. I did eventually get a job in acute because I wanted to have the acute experience before because I was going to do my general nursing. I'd always planned. And I wanted to do it within this time scale before I started my general nurse training. So I did actually get a job in um, acute nursing, but it was a little while afterwards. I can't say that I was bullied. Um, I would say I was treated differently. And I, I would say, would I have noticed if, if I was at the time? Because I think you, I use the word conditioned. Is that the right word? You get used to a way that people treat you, that it's just, you know. And I've, I suppose I didn't make a big thing about it. I just thought, suck it up, you know what you've got to do. And it was always about getting my qualifications, um, and I always said I was going to be, get myself into a place where I could make a difference. So it's almost as though you've got to take the the bad before the good will come. Um, and I've always been very, very, very fortunate, and I sort of emphasise that, in that those challenges um, were countered by, excuse me, um, having great friends and family that I could talk to. Um, so I'm thinking of sort of examples where I remember working on a ward where I'd gone in as a staff nurse and the ward manager, I could tell, he didn't like me too much and he would give me all the, you know, the shifts. You think, why well, have I got seven lates? <laughs> you know, and not having um, much, you sort of just get on with it. Because there's no point in fighting because then you seem to be awkward or you're the one that's challenging. But I'm smart, so I'd swap shifts with my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I remember I, I'm avid Manchester United supporter and I would be on every weekend and I used to go to football matches. And this one particular season, I went to every Manchester United um, game. And in my supervision, he says, can I ask you something? I says, what's that? He said, how come you get to go to every game? I said, I swap with my colleagues. And it was almost though he'd almost like a test. He'd put me on these awful shifts, but because of my relationships that I'd developed with my colleagues, I was able to swap. I had favours throughout the whole of summer. <laughs> I was working every weekend throughout the whole of summer. But it was like, OK, don't fight it. Beat it, if that makes sense. You know, there's another way to get round it. So no, don't go to him to necessarily change the ship. It's what with your colleagues. And it's those little things. That, and I say it's that somebody sort of like doing that tapping at you, you know, and you have a choice. I made the decision not to be the noisy person to fight with it. I would gently, quietly make a difference or challenge it or I say challenge it navigate those challenges. I did a pre-registration, it was an 18-month uh, course, and I was the only black person in my class. So, um, yeah, it was di very different now. It was, in Cent it was in the middle of London, it was in Tooting, it was uh, South West London in St George's. Great school of nursing, great training, lovely time. and. I had, it was almost like every other ward, you'd have a good experience, bad experience, good experience, bad experience, because it was a multicultural um, school of nursing, um, hospital. So if you went to a ward where you had a white sister, it might not be so good. And then you might counter it with a staff nurse or um, a sister on another ward that would sort of support you. Um, so that's kind of made you, um, keep going and it would be like I say the little things you've had your break and I think well hang on I've only had five minutes can you come back from your break those little things the, the bad shifts um opportunities uh you know again 
opportunities to, to learn weren't always the same. You'd have to say, can, ask to your colleague, can you show me how to do that? Because somebody else had had more chances of um, practising something. I remember one particular ward where I just didn't get the opportunity to do the practical things from a staff nurse or an SR, you know, an SEN as it was then. And it would be your, your, your colleagues showing you how to do it, you know, that because we used to learn alongside each other. Um, but I found a way, and I, I guess I, I said, I'm quite, I think I'm quite resourceful. And I don't mind sort of sitting, staying behind and say, I don't mind staying a bit longer because I think if there's an opportunity to learn, then I would try and, and do that. So. So in terms of negotiating what, you know, sort of learning experiences, um, you know, you, you, because you, we also, you know, you knew what you had to do. There was, you know, particular skills that you set that you had to learn and you'd look at your list and think, oh, I've not done this, I've not done that, especially, you know, you have your report, what needs to be completed. And um, you would speak to, it might be an SEN who is a black SEN and say, oh, can you show me how to do that? And they'd almost like be wary, weary, wary, wary of um be wary of doing that whilst the sister was on you know because they might get into trouble but the, and, it's, and there was this kind of the look at you as if to say i'm sorry but they couldn't because they were looking after their jobs and it would be you, and i would say you'd have to look over the shoulder of somebody else who was being taught does that make sense so you think well i'm supposed to be doing this see how i can navigate my way in to get to, to do that or you'd say to the person who'd been taught especially on back in the day you'd have a first year a second year and a third year student often on the ward and if you were a first year then you were lucky if you could see but if you found if you had a good second and third year student along with you they'd pull you along and that's what you were often very dependent dependent on um, other students helping you not in all cases but in some cases and um but the, i was saying about when you went to you went from one ward to the next so you would then counter um encounter um a great sister and i remember having this great sister who knew I, i'd got a bit of a mouth on me i could speak up and she said learn to speak at the right time so that was a lesson that i learned and she gave me opportunities and it was almost as though you don't have to always shout to be heard you know so those are the those are the nuggets that you take away um i took away um from those black nurses who had obviously gone through um what we'd gone what I, what i was going through and they didn't sort of necessarily use the word racism i don't think it's the word that we we used i think it was we know it happens um, and we didn't, we weren't all, and I say, we, I'm going back a few years ago now, we weren't so vocal about our experiences. We kind of accepted it as part of, this is just what we've got to go through to get to where we want to get to. When we get there, then we can make the changes. It was like, you know, buckle down until you get, knuckle down until you get there. I think it was when I'd got both my RMN and my RJ, and I'd got my qualification. I thought can, nobody can take those away from me now. So I started to be a bit more vocal and and not in a kind of shouty way either. I would challenge, I could challenge, well, why is that person on that amount of medication? Um, this black person on this amount of medication. Um, I gave out depot injections and I gave out tablets and I think, hang on, there's a difference. And I was actually starting to notice in it. And I think that's where the knowledge and the experience is now. Hang on a second, this doesn't make sense. I'm also being more, um, become more aware of the world, what was going on in the world. I think for a long time I kind of stuck to my books and was, you know, that's what I, I knew. And yes, things were happening around in the world and, um, Horrible things were happening in the world to black people. And I was affected by that. You know, um, I go back some years earlier before leaving home and there was a Manchester riot. And I remember that being one of the first times I was frightened. And my younger brother was pushed against a wall by a police officer because he was tall, not because of his age, just that he was tall and he was going in the wrong direction and being really frightened for us. And that sort of you know that stays in your background and then you start to get a bit older and you start to think hang on a second what was that about then and it kind of all starts to um doesn't make sense it you kind of you kind of be affected by it 
um, and then living in London. Uh, as I said, my cousins, my cousins lived in London, two black men who um, had had some pretty rough time with the police. So that starts to affect you. And then you work in a nursing environment and you're seeing things um, that aren't nice. Yeah, so there's things that you see that um, cha I said changes the way you look at the world, you know, and you as a you then realise that I, well not then not anybody I was real I had to I had a responsibility um, to try and make a difference, and I think when I was saying to myself I want to get my qualifications I didn't know what difference it was that I was going to make, and I think it was probably the late late. Um, 89, 90, roughly around then. Um, and there was a CPN then, and that's when I was really sort of starting to love my work and stuff. Unfortunately, my mum passed away. And that brought me sort of, you know, back to Manchester. Long way to get there, but I eventually came back to Manchester. And again, I sort of wanted to work with my own community. I thought, well, I want to go and work with, you know, people that I grew up with. And coming back to Manchester was quite um, scary because I'd see, I could see my friends that had got mental illness now. I was like, hang on, we used to play together and they'd now been suffering from psychosis and stuff. And these people I'm talking to them saying, what's gone on, what's happened? And they're telling me about their experiences and a lot of it was to do with racism and how they'd been treated back at school or they'd been treated at work and how it had impacted them. And I was thinking, God, and I think, there but for the grace of God, go I. So, yeah, sad. Some of it was really sad. Uh, and I say that because um, there was people, literally girls at my from my school, uh, that I was now... Their, their, their nurse, you know, and it's like, can I do this? But I could because I wanted a better outcome for them. I don't think I was never disrespectful. I always respected. So often I'd lose the argument because that's the consultant and they would have. But what I could do is influence or encourage a conversation with a community psychiatrist, others, um, a social worker and other people that were involved in the care. And, you know, and sort of like, oh, actually, let's think about reducing the person's medication. They're spending all their time in bed, yes, because they're on loads of medication. If we reduce it, they might... So it was having those, and it literally was... I think I'm charming, um, but using, you know, the skills that I've got, but also the knowledge. Um, I, had in, I felt that I had enough sufficient nouns about me to have, have a discussion. I remember one patient, and this is, it was a black consultant though, and I think that was pivotal to this person's outcome. And we literally, Every other day we were negotiating this person's medication in the community. Every week I'd say, come on, just take it for two days. Let's reduce it. But the consultant was, was responsive to that. Because the, the consultant's view was, if you take something, it's better than nothing. Because this person was really, really unwell. And because the, per, because the patient felt that they were being listened to, they took their medication and actually had this really long period of um, not being hospitalised. I mean, and I, I, I sit there, and I was it's one of my, um, what's the word, my really positive outcomes. It was just, this is somebody who was really, really unwell, really psychotic, um, and I literally was living at home with his mum, really, really, I mean, really quite ill. When I left after three and a half years um, working with this young man, he'd got his own flat, and he cooked me lunch um, for my... Because uh, he wanted to take me out. I said, no, you can't take me out for lunch, <laughs> but I will have lunch with you. And he cooked me lunch on my last day with him. So, um, and but that was all about negotiating. And trust me, he used to make me work hard to negotiate, but it was worth it at the end, yeah. So I think I, changed, I made a difference to his life. When I was working through this, I thought once I've got my career, once I've got my qualifications, it will be fine. You apply for a job, you don't get it. You apply for a job, you don't get it. You apply for. Hang on, why am I not getting these jobs? And 
change your tact, you know, you think, well, okay, let's maybe not go down that area, go down this area. And I, I think it was, I'm trying to think of the right words. It was almost as that I was going to achieve come what may. And so you you get that first promotion and you go to, you know, um, I remember one particular job and I'd gone, I was the only black person in the management team. And I started the job in the August, this is 2008. And this is significant. November, President Obama was voted in. Some staff had never spoken to me until the day after President Obama came in. And they said, oh, wasn't it great that you won? And I thought, oh, you do know, I do exist. And it was almost as though the fact that we'd got a black president, they could now see me. And that was really kind of um, strange, shocking, sad. But also it gave me a bit of power. I said, yeah, he's my cousin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but it was almost as though, you know, I thought, OK, this is how it's going to be. Um, I, it was like, I see you, you know, and I kind of understand, you start to understand the games that people play. Um, and, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was challenging. And I became the conscience of the boardroom. That's, you know, really, I was the conscience of the boardroom. I wanted to get another promotion, <laughs> dare I, <laughs> and it just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> it was blocked. It, I felt, I mean, I, I'm not a person, and I, I will say this categorically, I've never been a third person that said it was because I'm black. You know, I think, well, have I got the right qualifications? Have I got the right skills? And then if I've looked, checked out, if, pardon me, I've, you know, is it because I'm a woman? I've checked out all of these, and I think, well, what else could it be? Because if I've got the right qualifications, I've got the right experience or more experience or more qualifications than, you know, my counterpart and I'm not considered for a job, then tell me what the reason is. You know, does my face not fit? Is it because I'm a northerner? So I said to somebody, is it because I'm a northerner? You know, as well as living down south. You ask the question because you ask the question, not necessarily, can you give me the reasons why? Nobody's going to say it's because you're black. No one's going to tell you that. I'd, I'd be very impressed if they did, but <laughs> nobody tells you that. But there's no other reason. You know, and I, and I always think maybe I wish I'd been strong enough to actually sort of, but how do you prove that? It's a really difficult thing to prove because they'll find a reason, another reason, and I say there, so, you know, employer and potential employers will find another reason other than it being your colour. I've retired in the last oh, a few years ago and uh, decided I'd come back to work. Uh, I'd started doing a bit of agency work and started working um, just before the pandemic. I started working for a particular trust. And, um, you know, things were starting to, I said, bubble, because we knew that something was going on, but we actually didn't realise what was going on. And I remember being, and it was literally, we were summoned, um, we all had to attend, and I say all, all the nurses of a certain grade had to attend a particular meeting where we had to do dunning and doffing. They were going to teach us how to do dunning and doffing, dunning and, I can never say it, dunning and doffing, um, because just in case we had to go out and do um, the swabbing of everybody and we were doing this to, the room was literally must have been about 30 to 40 people in this room and it was the who video that we watched how we were going to do the donning and doffing and then we had to go and do the testing for the um masks they were going to do the mass fitting so everybody's done this mass fitting of course i've failed and the only black woman in there said it doesn't fit my nose and then we said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I said, it doesn't fit my nose. Because I could smell, once they'd put the thing over my head, I could still smell the scent. Oh, well, you just have to do the, the, the doffing then. 
not you don't have to put the thing on, you just have to help somebody else to do it. And I thought, that doesn't solve the problem. And it was literally kind of thrown away. And I remember going home and saying to my cousins, because I've got a few cousins that are nurses, and I said, you make sure that they're, they mass fit you properly. Because I just had this vision of people not being fitted with the right PPE. And I then, sort of within my job, because I had to work from home for a little while because I um, started at Shield, and they allowed me to work from home. And I was looking after PPE. I'm probably the world's worst person they should have put on PPE because I was like a dog with a bone. You've got to get me some PPE <laughs> on my staff. But, and it was, I mean, the challenges we know, you know, it, it's well documented about the challenges of PPE. But I remember phoning staff at work and said, have you got enough stuff? And they were saying, no, it's gone missing. And what was, I don't know. I mean, I will never truly know. But I felt that people were taking extra, um, not leaving sufficient for their colleagues. And unfortunately, again, a lot of the black staff were working on the night shift. And it was like, OK, this does not make me feel comfortable. And it, and it was... Yeah, it just wasn't a nice. I was I always feel really uncomfortable about that because I just thought, well, people are not getting enough um, stuff to protect them. I had this awful feeling that you know that day staff were taking the um, PPE and taking the PPE and not leaving sufficient for their colleagues that were going to be working on the night shift and you know unfortunately the truth is that a lot of night staff are, um, are from you know BME black communities and they were the ones that were left without and we all know um, unfortunately at the start of the pandemic the people that were um, that were, were dying the, the um, NHS staff were black and from man you know from ethnic minority backgrounds and it bothered me. It bothered me. I was taken off PPE. <laughs> That's how I was, it was no longer your responsibility, Karen. It really was. And my contract came to an end. But, you know, I did, I, I said that was the worst person they could have given it because I was literally, I'd skipped all that, I went straight to the boss and I said, there's something needs to be done. I shouldn't say it like that. But I was an agency nurse and I, I'm, I'm disposable. Sounds awful, but, you know, they ended my contract. In regards to the, the pandemic, one of the things that sickened me is that it was found out quite easily, quite early on, that people from black and minority ethnic groups, BAME groups, um, were being, what's the right word? We were being more affected by COVID-19 than other groups, but yet we were the groups that were asked to go and work on the COVID wards. I have two cousins, one friend, and they were all gone asked, black friend, nurses that were asked to work on COVID-19. And I'm asking why, and I'm saying why. <laughs> and, not on, and actually getting really angry um, with them. I got angry with them, I said, don't do it. But of course, they need their jobs. And they felt that they had to. And I said, well, surely there's got to be an alternative place for you to work, you know, if you do, because I'd done the risk assessment, so if it's you know if you are at risk, then why would you be put into that situation? But despite that, they were. I mean, I can't advocate. I can only shout so loud. Um, but I was frustrated for them. I remember speaking to um, young carers who were asked to go to patients' houses. These were carers in the community who were asked to go to patients' houses without. They didn't know if they'd got COVID. They didn't know if they'd got, they hadn't got the right PPE, then, you know, basic stuff. Talking to people that were working in the community at the time, um, there was a panic. There was a sense of panic um, on lots of different levels in that they didn't have the right PPE. They were having to go into environments that they had no idea what they were going to um, to meet and not feeling they were supported by their employers and employees. And I remember saying to somebody, don't do it. 
if you feel that you're at risk, you just said, I would say to people, look after yourselves first. I mean, I've had to learn the hard way. So, and that's the bit of advice I'll say to every nurse, look after yourself first, because if you can't look after you, then you can't look after somebody else. And looking after yourself is making sure that you've got the right equipment. So it's, I felt that, it's a strong word, but I felt some people felt abandoned by um, their employers at that time. I mean, I literally, I just remember somebody crying on the phone to me. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And I had to sort of just use the help of to find the right words to speak to her employer. She got help eventually, but she had to find the words. And I don't think she would have done, maybe without the conversation with myself, but I didn't have anything to lose. And I said to her, at the end of the day, you will find another job, but go in there and be strong. And I think, and I guess that's the difference to me now, than me as a student nurse. I wish I'd had somebody to give me the words to say. So I suppose that's what I try to do now, is help somebody to find the right words to, to, to speak to their colleagues, to speak to their managers so that they're not, um, they don't get weighed, sort of weighed down with all of this stuff, you know, so that they shine now. Um, and it's interesting because I think I didn't have to do that after a while because Black Lives Matter had happened in the middle of it. And I think, no, I don't think, the youngsters found their voice. And we've had a conversation, as, and I say we, as, as older people in our family, saying that the, the youngsters now have got a voice that we didn't have. And that people, it's, it's a conversation about race is e much easier. It's not always e pleasant, but it's an easier topic, to, an easier thing for people to bring up. Well, during the pandemic, you know, so I was doing the risk assessments and as I mentioned, you know, friends, cousins, um, fam you know, family members were being asked to work in the places, you know, COVID wards. I mean, where the COVID patients, people with COVID went, went to. And for me, I thought that was wrong um, because it felt as though that despite managers, employers knowing that people um, outcomes were high on the risk assessments, that they were still being put to the front. So it makes you wonder what was the point of the risk assessment. Yes, we've done it, but actually we're ignoring what's been the outcome of that. And I remember one person in particular who's not a nurse, but was told to shield and was told to come into work. And they were sort of very high on this on their risk assessment that they shouldn't be in the environment, but they were told to come into work. You know, so again, it's that there was an. It, 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 they just ignored people ignoring, ignoring the, um, the, the, you know, the tool that's been formulated to prevent these things happening, and you know, and then so the numbers grew and grew and grew, and that's just in my little world, you know. So who knows what was going on in the rest of the world? When the pandemic happened, when I say when the pandemic was happening, I was working from home and I had that choice to stay at home. So I looked after my vulnerability and I said, that's me looking after myself. However, I did take a job and I went to work in an, I thought, well, you've got to get out there, start to work. This was back in October and I did feel vulnerable. So I ended the contract I needed. You know, I ended, I said, I didn't, I didn't think I'd, it was safe for me to work there. And they're just at the COVID-19 um, restrict, not restrictions, uh, protocols were not, I felt, in good, were not put together very well and people weren't sticking to them. But I was able to, because I'm an agency nurse, to make that decision, I'm looking after me. So I said, I think I'll not come anymore. <laughs> It's interesting that we talk about agency nurses because I think we think you've got a choice, um, but not always. Uh, and there were some people that had worked on a particular place for years and years and years, or months and months and months, and sometimes years, actually. And then in the middle of the pandemic, they were put somewhere that was so acute and so not what they were used to. So 
not only were they being put at risk because of their um, the vulnerabilities, but also in terms of their skills. So they were sent to a places that they didn't have the skill set to read or not up to date skill sets to work in, and so that was put not in just them but also patients potentially, um, not having the right um, skill sets in place. So. Yeah, there's interesting things that went on. And we can all appreciate that, you know, we were all, and I say we were all kind of, OK, what do we do now? We were still we were changing and learning all the time. But I think sometimes common sense just went out of the window. I think when I talk about people being asked to go and work on a ward where patients have got COVID-19, knowing that they are potentially at higher risk of getting COVID-19. It was like, I can't think of another analogy. I can't think of an analogy right now, but I will think of one. Um, but it's, I think it was awful. I just, it's, my cousin got COVID and I'm going to get upset now. <laughs> um, I was so scared. I was so scared. And um, she's a tough old boot and she's fine. <laughs> but yeah, I was scared um, because I couldn't understand why you'd want to do that. Why would you send somebody? It's almost like sending someone to their death. That's what I felt they were doing. Um, that's what I felt they were doing. It's funny because as I'm talking, thinking about her, I wish I'd got her to do this. <laughs> because her experience as a nurse is probably so different to mine. Because she came from Jamaica. She's the same age as me, she came from Jamaica. And some of the stories that she tells me that she's had to go, and I've had to say to her, you can't shout, <laughs> you know, you can't, you just got to take your time. We use the lamp. We use the phrase "take your time." You've got to just, you know, hold your, you know, hold your peace. And I was, and my view, to, my way of dealing with things is not respond when I'm angry. And I've had to teach her um, how to, and I use the word navigate the NHS and navigate um, situations. And yeah, and I think that's. And I think it's those things like that that um, she, I think she's probably a little bit less, pa she's a bit pa more passive now. And it's probably there's a little bit of guilt there because I think maybe if I'd not told her to look, maybe stand up for herself a bit more, she might not have been put in that situation. So I just had a moment there of feeling a bit guilty, like, yeah. You don't always know at the time the difference that you're making. It's only when sometimes later somebody will say, oh, you were the nurse that helped me with this, or you were the person that spoke to me when I was going to think, really? Because, you know, unfortunately through, you know, you meet so many people in your nursing career, you don't remember everybody. Um, and I want to make a difference to black people's mental health, black people's physical health. Um, and, you know, I work, and I would say it's a passion. You know, it's something that's in me. I want to, um, even if, I would say if it's just one person that I can change or let them think, ah, maybe, is this, is this, is that, is, when I say maybe, you know, maybe my practice isn't, um, I was going to use the word authentic, without race, you know, you know, is it sort of, is it, am I being equal? Am I treating everybody equally? And that's what I want to, and that's what keeps me going. Because um, despite the fact that I've retired, I've come back and I'm still, I say, fly, you know, <laughs> flying the flag and keep on, keep on keeping on, really. If I'd been in charge at the beginning of the first pandemic, I would have ensured that everybody had the right PPE. And I would have 
because that's important, you know. Um, and I think the risk assessments would have been stuck to. I think we'd have to be in a. We, I would have been. I like to think I'd have been creative in um, ensuring that care was delivered. And I think I use the, the examples of some of the nursing homes where staff moved in and, you know, a group of staff were dedicated there. I'm not saying that necessarily that was for everybody, but they dedicated, they said, right, OK, we're going we're gonna to stay and ensure that these residents got the care that they required. I'm not saying that I'm asking nurses to do that, but it would have to have been a bit more creative. I don't know what, really, but um, I think PP was so important and I think it was the cause for, um, I think, cause for a lot of people um, passing away, dying. I think that... Um, I don't think we took it serious enough. We didn't look at what was going on in the rest of the world and learning, watching what was going on there and thinking what could we learn from from that. And that's, that's, well, that's what's that view that you need to have? <laughs> that global view. Um, when I think about the the pandemic and how it's affected me on a physical and a mental um, vet state. It's really quite, I think I'm cool. I think I'm, I can manage most things. And I, I remember being worried. That's my first, I just say worried. Um, I thought, OK, this is going to be an interesting scenario. Um, when I was looking at, because I'd been, attended a couple of meetings, and I thought, OK, this is, this is big. You know, and there's a little bit of worry. Um, and I'd, there was a little, you know, the little niggle in your head. You think, OK, so what do you need to do? Um, and then, obviously, I, I had to start to worry about myself, because I thought, OK, if I get COVID-19, they say I've got to, to, uh, to shield. What does that mean? Didn't know all of what that meant. But I will shield. And when I'm worried about things, I get busy. So I was busy with work, so that was fine. So I was working lots of hours at work at home. That was keeping me busy, so I was a little bit distracted. And I... Um, then you get scared. And you were scared for your friends, your family, your family, friends, colleagues that were out there actually on the shop floor thinking, oh, my God, my colleagues are going to... You know, something's going to happen to them, your patients, because I'd left a group of patients and um, what's going to happen to everybody there. Um, and then you're managing your life as well and your family, because obviously I'm the, you're one of the nurses in the family, so my phone was a hotline. Um, people rang you, what do we do? I don't know. Let me find out. What do you think about this? I don't know. And literally all over the world, people... We would, you know, there was this, and I used the word, there was an anxiety amongst us, us all. And I can manage that quite well, usually. <laughs> and I'm saying, I don't know. <laughs> and, but being really honest with people and saying, look, I'm as scared as you, um, but this is what I'm doing, you know. So I'm keeping myself safe and I'm, you know, trying to shield. And I used the word trying to shield because I didn't do it properly. And there's a reason for that, because I did the first three weeks perfect. I stayed at home, did as I was told, and then went out and had an anxiety attack. Never had an anxiety attack in my life. I was like, oh, my God. And it was this, I thought, people coming close to me, I was getting all like this, and I thought, hang oh, on a second. If I do 12 weeks, God knows what I'll be like. And that was, I must go out once a week then. But that was my saving grace. But well, that was me putting therapy for myself because <laughs> I thought I need to go out once a week. Otherwise, at the end of it, I'll be not good for anybody. So I had to start to look after myself from that, literally from week three. But also look after my family and sort of like, sort of literally sort of give people little jobs to do or little things to do that would make them feel, and I use the word normal. Um, we had family Zoom meetings until that wasn't, we realised that wasn't normal for us. <laughs> You know, that's not a normal thing that we would do. Let's leave that. Um, so, 
my uh, my physical health went up and down and my mental health went up and down and they got to there was a point in the middle of it and I thought actually this isn't that bad you know I I'm happy being on my own I'm happy to you know make things and bake and cook and stuff and that's what I did I looked after my community So the clapping was a funny one. So I think the first two weeks I went out, none of my neighbours did. Oh no, sorry, one of my neighbours did. And then I thought, I don't really even know I'm a nurse. <laughs> um, and then I thought, why? Yeah. Why? <laughs> so I didn't do it anymore. George Floyd being murdered and um, and there was a sense of, well, it was, I say, um, shock, but then not. It's a really strange thing to say. It was shocking what we saw, but I, it's happened before. But this time it was, I think people had just had enough. And I say people, I was one of those people too. I'd had enough. Um, and, you know, you cry out of anger, you cry out of sadness, you cry out of frustration. And the tears of, uh, how many, you know, have we got to put up with this anymore? We're not going to put up with this anymore. We're not going to tolerate the killing and, you know, of people, black people. And I I was, I think I was stunned initially. Cause I, you know, it was like, almost like I, someone choked me. I, I didn't know what to say. I, like, if I, can't, I remember saying to people, don't talk to me about it. Cause I didn't know whether I was gonna respond angrily or I was gonna say something constructive. So I had to sort of process my thoughts. And, you know, I think it was, first of all, you sort of, responded and it was tears you know we'd be talking to your friends and we'd be crying on the phone can you believe this I've got lots and lots of family in America half of my family in America and I remember being frightened for them literally there was this fear because I thought there's going to be civil unrest over there people are going to kill them and all of that concern as well was going on and but through as time went on people that wouldn't ordinarily speak spoke and the younger generation, and I remember watching the marches, because I didn't go to the marches, because I was shielding. Um, and I remember saying, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage you to do it, but I want you to be there and being very proud of my cousins. I remember them sort of them, them doing videos and watching them stand from a distance. They'd got their mask and I thought, great, they're doing all the right things, but they were there. And I remember saying, you're representing me at this point. Um, and the conversation started or was, I mean, I've got, cousins that are very, and I've got a huge family, so I say cousins, there's literally hundreds of us. Um, there's cousins that are quite militant anyway. We say they use the word militant, who are quite vocal in their thoughts on Black Lives Matter. But it was the younger generation. We're now getting into the dialogue. We're now speaking. Well, what can we do? What can we do differently? And as the elders, because we call ourselves the elders now, um, trying to say to them, well, yeah, don't go out there. We don't want you to go out and respond in a negative way, but let's do something constructive. And I mean, some of my little cousins have started doing artwork and um, doing poetry and, you know, sort of their, their artistic side is coming, but it's their voice through their music. Some of them has written, some of them have written music. And we're very proud of that way, but it's not just in our family. It's like other families are doing this and there's, there's a strength now that, that I, we didn't have, or I say that we didn't have, we didn't have it in the same way. It wasn't a global, a global response to racism. And I think that's what this has happened now, has happened now, is this global response to racism and uh, racism and it's got to stop. We had um, an occasion where I'd gone back to work after not working, and I um, 
went back to a place that I worked many, many years ago. And who do I see but one of my old colleagues, who was the other black person that was there at the time. And one of the things that we talked about was, wow, life, how's life changed or not, as the case might be. And we were saying, you know, I remember talking to Ash and saying to Ash, I said, boy, Ash, I said, you know, it's not, it's not like when we were here 30 years ago, yeah, but now we've got a voice, we can speak out and be a bit stronger. And I felt there was more, um, we had a voice or we weren't afraid to speak about race, whereas before we might have let it happen or let it slide off us, we wouldn't have challenged it. I think the both of us, maybe because we were older, I'm not sure, but maybe because of Black Lives Matter, I think that's probably more that it was a topic that we weren't afraid to, to bring up. Um, it was something that, you know, t ask me, <laughs> you know, we'll challenge. We, we felt, I felt, and I think the conversation that I was having with him was that, you know, we can now speak. Um, there was up to a bit of sadness really as well because we were both sort of saying, can you imagine if we'd have had these conversations years ago, how we might have progressed in our careers? Because I think we both felt we'd hit our glass ceilings at some point. Um, and had we had the conversations about inequality and um, racism, that um, we might not have, that the glass ceiling might have been a bit higher for us. I was talking about that patient that I was talking about earlier. Um, when he, he went to college, he went off to college and I remember him saying to me, oh, I can get a computer. So what do you mean you can get a computer? And he told me he'd worked out how he could get a com computer to assist him with his college work. And he'd done it all on his own. And I remember thinking, I went, look at you. <laughs> and that makes me smile because I didn't tell him what to do. He knew what to, he found out what he needed to do. So somebody that people had virtually given up on at one point had gone to college and, Yes, yeah, so that's one of those little things that always makes me feel warm inside. And I think that's that's a proud moment. There's another proud moment, which is a bit of a, it's a clinical, no, it's not clinical. I applied my organisation, the first consultant nurses come out, and we had to put in some bids. And there was five bids went from the organisation, and my bid won. <laughs> so I was like, yes. <laughs> So the others didn't get a mine one, but that's one of those little things that that was a nice moment. Yeah. We're, we're not going to assume anything because I think lots of times assumptions are made um, that, you know, we have an equality policy. So there's an assumption that the equality policy is being um, adhered to, but actually it's not. But let's have a conversation. How is this not? Um, how is this equal? Um, that's the question that, that I'd love to have those kind of conversations.